And amen. So this morning, brothers and sisters, we're going to start our new year together. And we had been walking through the principles of what it means to be a Christian, what it is about Christian faith, and what is it about what God has done for us. And I want to remind us this year to, to, to come before the Lord uh, and allow Him to have His way with us to grow our faith. So we're going to be looking at this this morning. I'm going to read you a portion of Acts chapter 20. I'll be reading verses 17 through 36 to have a context. Um, and I do ask that you please stand for the reading of God's Word. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears. And in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jew and Greek that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I'm innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole counsel of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of God's church, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage will, wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after themselves. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning you, night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine supply my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself. It is more blessed to give than to receive. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. May God bless the reading of his word to your soul. You may be seated. So Father in heaven, this is a Amazing truth, Lord, that's set before us. There's so much here. Lord, lead me in such a way that your people would be changed, Lord, and understand your mighty work for our souls. Bless us this way, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So, brothers and sisters, this is a, an amazing word. We, we stand in awe 
of what God has done, what he does to his people. And this historical account, this, this, this eyewitness testimony of what Paul did at this particular place, at this particular time, and his faithfulness is so evident here. And it is such a clinic, it's such a foundation stone for all of us that we can glean so much from. So let's walk through some of this text. And we're going to hit on some of these high points. There's so much here. Um, we'll, we'll walk through it. So from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. So this is a grand call. Um, imagine, if you will, the leaders of a particular church were called back in this day. They needed to walk about 30 miles based on the call. This is no small task. It's a significant event. Again, driven by faith. These are elders that he had set in place in Ephesus. And he had called them out of this portion of Turkey to this city that's uh, on, the, on the shore. And the text is telling us that Paul was sent by God as an evangelist to this particular place. He preached publicly. People would ask questions of him. He would then go to their homes and preach and teach them about the Lord more clearly in opposition to the culture. And boy, oh boy, what a context for us today. This is exactly what you and I face. Paul himself was steadfast in the truth of the gospel in such a way there was nothing that can shape him. They, they were to change him. They, they, were, they were trying to kill him. They were, he was in danger in every direction as he has written in other places in the word of God. But he was dedicated by the faith, by the truth of what God had offered him, by the, by the mercies of God. He was led to a go to these places and do these things. In this particular place, and in all the places that he went, this was common for him. He would go and preach publicly, and then he would, as people came to faith, as people came to believe, he would then establish churches. And he's reflecting back to the brothers that he had commended to the Lord and called them to be a witness of what was going on at this place and at this time. He details this in verse 19, that he served the Lord with great humility and tears in the midst of severe testing by the plots of the Jews. You know, again, this is a great picture of faith on display. How weak am I sometimes to not offer a word of hope? To not bring a word of truth to bear in a particular situation that God has called me to? How often do I miss? How often do we all have these opportunities that Ephesians 2.10 tells us that God had predestined for us to do these good works. But he's full of grace and mercy. And he's trying to build us up and encourage us to be faithful in these places. Verse 20 says, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you. He wasn't there to, to build up someone's pride or ego. No, 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 no. The exact opposite. The exact opposite. He wasn't there to, to individually boost them up. That's not what Paul's plan was. His, his plan was to preach the gospel faithfully. And he did it publicly. And he would then go to people's homes and preach the gospel and encourage and strengthen people in the word, in the truth that the Lord Jesus himself had taught him. Verse 21 says, And I have declared to both Jew and Greek that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's really where the rubber begins to hit the road in this, in this picture. And I think we live in a day where the church, in a, in a very common way, has, has really gone sideways in this culture. Um, 
you talk to people, we were having conversations this morning, and it just brings it further to light. You try to help someone. They're going to move. They're going to go somewhere. And you'll look to see if there's a, someone who's faithful, someone that would stand before the people of God and open his word and make it clear to them and encourage them in the faith to, to call them to repentance, to be unashamed of the doctrines of the Bible and how difficult it is to find men who are unashamed of the gospel this day, I had the privilege of meeting with some friends yesterday, and we had the same exact conversation. And it was peculiar, because they had been raised in a Christian home, and we're having this great fellowship, great conversation. And this brother had just come to faith, literally, late 20s. Um, he had grown up in a home that was fundamentalist, sort of legalist, and he was living by morality. He was living by his accomplishments. He was living by his effort. He was living by his understanding of what he ought to do to please God. And I encourage us, brothers and sisters, that we would search our soul for the remnant of that in our own hearts, because it's there. It is there. This is not an if to the Christian. We all believe that in some way our effort, our works, are doing something for our salvation. We are all, when we've been born again, we are all recovering legalists. We're all recovering. We, in the absence of the truth of God, in the absence of the essence and the depth of the truth of the gospel, we are trying to work this stuff out on our own power. We're trying to do it in our own strength and our own understanding. And the Bible's replete. Absolutely not. That is a way of morality and it's a way of wickedness because you're trying and I'm trying to add to the cross. We're trying to add to the, the masterful, powerful, all wise work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we so often use this word grace, and, it's, and we talk about faith being a grace of God, and it is. It's a mercy of God that he opens our hearts to receive him. And this conversation continued yesterday, and the peculiarity of it is that we, we, were, we were just rejoicing together in his new status. And in in the, he understood the love of God. He understood very clearly the power of the cross that he was no, under, no longer under the judgment and under the wrath of God. He had been that wrath had been removed from him, and the love of Jesus Christ had been flowed into his heart in ways it was amazing. And we were sort of enjoying this moment together that we had truly come. He and I were rejoicing in the thought that when we had understand and understood that the judgment of God, that great weight of judgment was removed from our souls, that we almost live in a way where we have PTSD about it. That we are just so dumbfounded, so absolutely overwhelmed that the judgment of God has been lifted off of our souls. And we now have liberty in Christ. We now have the privilege of exercising the faith that God has offered freely in His Son, in His Word of Truth, to guide us out of this world and into righteousness, into peace, into joy. And I encourage all of us that we would look upon the work of God Almighty Himself with faith, because you cannot believe the truths of God revealed in His Word without faith. That is the heart of all of this. Hebrews chapter 11 gives us a, and we could do a multiple sermon just on Hebrews 11, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. Powerful truth. Hebrews 11 one says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. You see, fundamentally, that's the root of it. You have not seen your Savior bleed and die on a cross for you, but you believe. 
And the only way you believe that, that there was a man who walked the dusty roads of Israel a couple thousand years ago, who lived a sinless life, unjustly took the justice of man and its wickedness upon himself, was scourged, beaten, and nailed to that tree, and then died upon it, was three days dead in a grave, and came out of that grave alive. There is no way on planet, if you believe that, you are born of God. You cannot believe a man was dead and rose from a grave and walked among us and gave convincing proof that thousands of people ascends to the Father and is interceding for us right now. That is foolishness to this world. It's nonsense. But by faith, the mercies of God awaken our conscience that we have confidence, not only that we believe that's true, because in the end, in the end, there's no hope for mankind on this earth without a risen Savior. There is no hope. It's just your opinion, your might, your effort. And when we look at our catalog, How's that gone? How, how, how does that work out? How, how much of a mess have you made? How much of a mess have I made of things that should have gone well, but, but, no, brothers and sisters, faith is a confidence. Faith is the rock under our feet that there is hope, that there is meaning and purpose in this life. And by the way, without this creator God, who made you in his image for his purposes, there's no purpose to your life. That's why this world is, is it's, it's why you got people marrying dogs. It's why you got people don't know, they can't figure out what a gender is. The nonsense and the folly that's just beginning, just a bud on the plant right now, that's going to come like a tidal wave and swamp this nation because it's gotten away from faith will cause God's people to run to Him. And that's really what we're looking forward to. That's what we're rejoicing in, by the way. We don't look at this world and go, I can't believe it. Oh, believe it. The Lord is mighty. The Lord does what He wills, where He will, when He wants to. And no one can stop His hand. So we look upon it and say, bless the name of the Lord. Look what He's doing. Ah, he's going to bring a people together. Ah, he's going to bring his church together. Ah, he's going to bind them together. Because that was his plan from the beginning. He would call people out from the world, and he would bring them together by faith to worship his holy name. For is not the Lamb worthy? We have hope. And it's beyond the grave. And we have an absolute standard of truth where our conscience can put our head down at night, not believing the lie, not having to try to twist reality to make an understanding of what we're looking at. Not at all. Faith is, is, is not complete, but it's pushing those things away from us. It's giving us a deeper understanding. It's giving us peace. It's the ground of it. And faith is, is in action. It's a confidence in what we hope for. Not a hopeful hope for like, you know, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow or something. It's nonsense. This is the risen Savior who, the God who cannot lie, has spoken and said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. Where I am, I want you to be with me. What a mighty God. And we believe that by faith and we have confidence in that. And we have assurance with that. By faith we understand. And this is critical because this is a day and age where somehow our faith is pointed at from this world and scorned with folly. You believe that? Well, yeah. You believe everything came out of nothing? You believe that that, that, uh, that order came out of disorder? 
You believe life came from non-life? Come on. They have great faith, and really, that's where the rubber hits the road. The question is, is our faith well-founded? Is our faith rightly centered? If you, look, God has designed us to worship. That's why you can look at the football game and people paint themselves up and they're going nuts. And they're enjoying those moments in their folly. They're, they're enjoying that. They're, they're worshiping. They got faith in something. But the question is, is a person's faith well-founded? Is it well-centered on something that actually will produce great peace, hope, or joy? And all of them put together? So God in His infinite wisdom tells us very clearly, here's, here's, here's the root. Here's the root. By faith we understand that the universe, everything, was formed at God's command. That what was seen was not made out of what was visible. We start with, in the beginning, God. By faith, we believe. And by the way, it's evident. It's self-evident. The fact that there's a creation demands with absolute authority that there is a creator. Nothing comes from nothing every time. I've said that hundreds of times in my life. And I used to believe nothing came from nothing. That's how foolish I was. But the world has a way of making that sound so slick and so smooth and almost interesting that, yeah, I'm going to study how nothing came from nothing and then became everything. And then this big explosion comes together and makes you and music and love and all these incredible things that we so enjoy. That's a lot of faith. It's just very poor faith, very unfounded faith. And it really speaks to the root of the issue, which is the problem we have. To sin. See, faith is the, is the sin dissolver. It's a sin resolver. It's a, it, it speaks to it very clearly because the, the issue of faith is that the person that has faith in something other than God doesn't want to deal with the moral dilemma. We all have a problem, and that is we have found ourselves to be guilty of sin and We've all found a rescuing device to not deal with it. Maybe before we were born again, sometimes even when we have been born again, the world's allurements, its glitter, are what are designed by the enemy to get your mind off of reality, of what's really true, what's, what God says is important. Peace, patience, joy, kindness, love, all the fruit of the Spirit, which is really what your soul, my soul, is longing for. In every relationship, in every place, we want this. We love this. We enjoy this. But we've all gone our own way. We've all created hollow cisterns where it does not hold water. Our idols, our work, our enjoyments, you know, alcohol, I mean, all sorts of directions of distractions that keep us busy not to deal with the things of the heart, not to deal with the conscience, not to, to sort of push away the guilt and the shame of either things that have happened to us or things that we've done. God won't have that. He comes to us banging upon our conscience continually for that faith is going to help us determine what is right and wrong, what is good or evil. This is the heart of the matter. We are all deceived by this world, and God is removing this from our eyes. And the only way we can see the truth is by faith. That's the bottom line of all of this. Because it's, the, it's faith that allows us to believe that this is the written word of God. God Almighty has spoken to mankind and He gave us His word. He has spoken clearly so you and I can understand. The all-wise, all-powerful Creator stooped down to become man and to do what we could not do for ourselves to redeem for Himself a people that were His very own. That's the faith that God has offered us. So faith is a grace. 
that God's people, the Bible uses this word elect, we believe this to be true, and that's God's business, by which God's people are allowed to believe. Now, we absolutely believe that the gospel is free and open to every single person. However, I don't believe that a man can change his own heart. I think, I believe the Bible is clear that God has to touch the soul of that. God has to reveal himself. God has to convict the conscience. God has to guide people. God's got to reveal himself in such a way that the conscience is pricked. That the soul becomes laid bare because of our actual sin. Because the sin that we have committed deserves punishment. For no sin can stand in God's presence. And we need this Savior. So we're able to believe by God. And that's all of God. He, he opened, and that's why we can look around and see people that don't respond. They're in, they hear the word, they hear the word, they hear the word, and they don't respond. God's got to do it. No different than my friend I was with yesterday. He was raised in a Christian home. He heard, he knows the word. If you talk to him, he's, ah, what a brother, what a Christian. You, he, and, he, and then when he says, I met the light, my heart, I, I knew the love of Christ for the first time in my life. That's faith. And he, God Almighty enabled him to believe. And he does it so that our souls are saved by the work of the Holy Spirit. And he does this work in our heart. And it's done primarily, not completely, the Bible says there's other ways, but mostly through the clear proclamation of the gospel. The true proclamation that you are a sinner under the judgment of God. You need a Savior I need a Savior, and Christ is that Savior. He is the only one. He's the only one that's dealt with the problem of sin and satisfied the justice that the judgment of our sin deserves. So clear proclamation of the gospel is designed by God to create faith. And faith in, this, in, the, in the heart of the believer is Never complete. It moves about. We, we, sometimes, we sometimes think that it wax and wanes. It really doesn't. This is, a, this is a distinction I'd like to make here. You see, our hearts are not singular. We don't have ultimate singular affections or singular understandings. Our heart is a division of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an amalgamation of, 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 of a whole host of ideas and thoughts and understandings in all different ways. And in some ways of that slice of the heart, we might have great faith. And in others, not so much. Not so much. That's why the necessity of continued repentance in the Christian life, and this is what Paul was talking about, they must turn to God in repentance. And just to reiterate, we, we've gone through repentance before, but repentance means a turning from and a turning to. So the, the idea is that we become aware from the word of truth and we turn either by command or by understanding, we turn from what God says is evil, and we turn to what God says is good. It's never an absence, by the way. It's not like, turn from this and just whatever. No, no, no. God says very clearly in His Word, when we, when we understand what He's saying to us, and we do, we have the Spirit of God in us, that there is a, there is a solution to the problem, not just don't do it. Not just don't do it. See, that's what the moralist viewpoint is. Just don't do that, and somehow you're okay. That is not true. It is not true. Don't be wrong. God wants you to turn from sin. He wants me to turn from sin. But not in my power. He wants all the glory and credit to his name. He wants to move you. He wants to guide you. And I'm telling you, when you're so, you can know this. Everyone here knows this. You have a sin. You've seen something in your life. And when God saved you, that sin, bang, like a firecracker, just blew it up. You knew it was evil, and he turned you from it. 
Lord, do this in us all in a greater way that we would see these slices of our heart and we'd be changed more and more into your image. For this is what our souls really desire. And when we receive it, we rejoice in it. So faith needs to be increased in many, many, many areas. It needs to be strengthened. And it's strengthened by the, by the work of the Holy Spirit in our life, that's for sure. And it's strengthened by this idea of what we're going to call the means of grace. How does faith grow in the people of God? The answer is through means of grace. What are they? Listening to a sermon is a means of grace. If faithful, someone's opening the Bible, they're telling you what it means, and giving it understanding for your soul is a means of grace. Your private devotions is a means of grace. Means of grace. Prayer. Fellowship with the godly is a means of grace. Listening to Christian music that's in theological agreement with what you believe to be true. This is very, very important. By the way, this is a this is in more important than you really realize because we have all sorts of music as a, in a really awesome way of capturing our imagination. And there are so many songs that they're nice and we like them, but boy oh boy, there's some things sometimes that are so wrong, but yet we sing along and we capture that idea in our heart. And, and, it's, and it's very difficult to root it out when you start telling people what the Bible says. But boy, I like that song. It, it, no, it, it, it's, it, 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 becomes, it becomes a battle. So we just be careful. Means of grace is, is helped by things that we are in agreement with, with what the Bible says. Okay? Of purposely avoiding evil influences. You know your weaknesses. I know my weaknesses. I, there are things and play, things I can't do. I can't do those things. I need to protect myself. This isn't like just I'm walking around. No, no, no. There's this, this is a concerted effort that God commands us through the obedience that comes from faith. That's what Romans 1.5 says. And understand this. This is not just well, the Spirit's guiding me. Yeah, He's guiding you away from things too. So when faith is building in us, we begin to understand who we are in a better way and begin to reject and then don't allow ourselves in those situations. Maybe He'll allow you to go back to speak truth there, but not until He's convinced you that that sin is evil and you won't be sucked back into it. I say this, I have, I have peculiarity, I have, I have people, and I go on Facebook, right, and you have these friends, and I have four friends in my, my high school class are on biker gangs, and I try to talk to them, and I, I used to have most, I used to do all that stuff, and I feel as though I'm prepared to talk to them 25 years later, you know, because I, I, I see what it is now, I see what, what, what's going on there. And I believe I can speak clearly to that. So it's part of one of my ministry goals this year is to be able to reach new people with the gospel and be able to bring the truth of God's word. Okay. It's another means of grace. Protecting your eyes. Reading the word of God is a means of grace. Think about, there are people in China that would they'd give you their arm if they had a Bible. Do you ever watch these YouTube videos? They get a Bible, they rip it up, and they give everyone a page, and they're just flipping out and praising God that they have a piece, a page of the written word of God in their hands. It's amazing. Bible studies. These, these are elements. These are all pictures of the means of grace based on the liberty and privileges that God has offered before us this day. So, by faith, we believe that the Word of God is true. And that's a very important aspect of our faith. Because I was, I, I was and I don't keep making examples about myself, but this is, I think this is important. When you read the Word of God, you're going to come across things you don't understand. You're going to come across things your soul hates. And I'll give you an example. The raising of Lazarus. 
Up until a few years ago, I really, I, I honestly, I struggled with it. I did. I, I struggled. I don't. I can't tell you exactly, exactly why. I don't know exactly why. But my soul was like, okay, I believe it. I do. But what's that about? And by God's mercy, He sent me a wise counselor, and I read a sermon that would be by George Whitfield on that text. And that that piece of scripture went from my soul really kind of was like, you know, to absolute rejoicing, absolute awesomeness of what the word was revealing there. So I say that when you come across things, just put a note in your Bible, call, text. We love to, to walk through those pieces of scripture with anybody that would that has an interest to, to satisfy the, their soul in that way. And that helps us to believe all the word is true. And, it, and, and when someone, when, when you have a piece of text like that, it now doesn't allow my soul, doesn't go and say, well, stay, sort of standing over it, you know. No, now it says, okay, Lord, send me a wise counselor so I can truly understand what this means. Or, Lord, reveal to me by your spirit what it actually means. Give me understanding. Guide me through your word to reconcile it. And the Christian by faith believes this is the word of God because God himself is the author and he is the authority of it. That's a very, very important point. This isn't just like, you know, we kind of got together and said that this is what this is. God Almighty himself has said this. So it's we that need to grow in our faith to come to this place where we're True. That's really the beginning and the end of it. This is absolute, pure truth. Your word is truth. We need to come to understand as we, our faith grows that it's true, yes, and then it becomes awesome and excellent and our absolute guide. It's our absolute guide to life. It's, it's, it's going to speak to every Situation that we're dealing with. Now, understand that's that's the relational stuff of life. It's not going to tell you what college you go to, obviously, but it'll give you directions what you maybe should stay away from in a lot of things when we're making decisions. Very, very important. By faith, we would we would apply the truth of the word in the decisions we're going forward with. We seek wise counsel by faith. And by the way, you don't have to take the counsel. <laughs> it's, it's part of your decision. You're responsible for it. But boy, oh boy, shouldn't people be asking for counsel? Shouldn't people say, hey, you know, this is going on here. What does the word say about it? And then receive the counsel and then deal with it. Very, very important aspect to living the Christian life by faith. So faith is in different degrees in all of us, right? And we got to understand that the goal of the Bible, when it comes to temporal understanding, is that love would grow amongst the people of God, and we would lovingly go out and faithfully share the gospel with others and fold them into the family of God when they come to faith and love them and help them and encourage them. And that's a growing. That's a, that's that's the that's the that's the Bible picture of walking and growing uh, that the that the the Bible uses so often. Okay. Now our faith is weak in some things. It's absolutely true. Our faith does get assaulted by the demons, by the devil himself. He sets himself up in lofty places in such a way that ideas move forth. That people that don't know truth begin to jump on board with foolish arguments, poor understanding, and then kind of tell each other that it festers into many things we see today that we call absurd, nonsense, foolishness. But to the Christian, the heart's right. I'm going to address sort of a side note on this. This is a principle that's important. We... There are, uh, there's this kind of idea that sort of there's a politic to this, but there isn't. You see, the conservative politics of the world aren't right either. 
That's moralism. That's a problem of the heart. Because here's where the problem really lies. They're, they're calling on principles that look good and sound smooth. Okay? And I'm not saying they're not better than other principles. I don't hear that. But to, to discern this wisely, you cannot be disconnected from Jesus Christ and proclaim these moral truths. Because that's what conservatism does. It disconnects itself from the Creator, from the truth itself, and then puts axioms that are in alignment with it. But that's just as evil. That's a moralistic morphine that will lull people into thinking all sorts of crazy things. And I bet you, if you know the people in your life, that they think they're even Christian in some way because they're, you know, they're conservative. That's nonsense. Don't get me wrong, I don't know how Democrats reconcile this in the Bible because they reject God in their party platform. I'm not going political, but this is an important thing for us to understand. We're neither. We're not of this world anymore. It's, it's imperative that we have faith and then choose our elected officials wisely. And I'll give you an example. This is, this is one of the things. So for someone to be my elected official... They have to have enough logic and understanding to be able to determine when life begins. If they can't figure that out, they're not smart enough to earn my vote. If you don't grasp that life begins at conception, you're actually not bright enough to lead. I will not vote for you. That's just a small little test. And I think it's important for all of us to, to have these understandings when we look at things. How can we Look at this through the faithful lens that God has given us, which is His Word. How do we discern this world rightly and reject what's evil and embrace what is good? That's what God wants for all of us. He wants that for us in 22, 23, until we drop dead. He wants us to be living by faith. And He asks a very peculiar question. When He returns, will he find faith on this earth. What a peculiar thought that is. Brothers and sisters, he'll find it here. He'll find it amongst God's people. We're not the only ones. Don't hear that wrong. God's got faithful churches around the world. He has his people. He keeps his people. He guides his people. He encourages his people. So, what must we do? What does this picture of this faith look like? So, number one, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we must live by faith. We must live by faith. Yeah. Romans 4, 12 says, we must walk by faith. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, we must stand firm in the faith. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 says, we must grow in faith. So, you can see that the faith that God's giving us is imperfect. Unlike what God has done in our regeneration. That's, what He has done in regeneration is absolutely perfect. It's absolutely complete. It's totally of God. But what we are in our conversion, in our response to that, is this growing and walking and standing and living. And there's where life, that's where life is really about. That's really the heart of the matter. When we come to understand that the wrath of God that was going to destroy and crush you has been removed. And in Galatians 5.1, it's for liberty that Christ has set your soul free. You now have the liberty to love without end. You have the liberty to have peace without end, both now and forever. And the commands of God, by the way, that we're learning to obey by faith are just practice for heaven. Because in heaven, what we're talking about here will be perfect. You will live by faith in perfect harmony with God in heaven. So our lives need to be this, this, this uphill slope as we're growing. Okay? We're, we've entered the narrow gate at the bottom. We're on that, that, that path. And as Revelation 14 says, we're ascending Mount Zion to meet the Lord Jesus.
That's our life. May 23 be that for all of us. May 23 be the year that faith, that where faith continues to grow in us in such a way that we then make an impact greater than we've ever made. An impact for the glory of God. For is not the Lamb that was slain worthy? Was He not worthy? And the answer is absolutely. He's the Savior of sinners. The Savior of souls. One more point on faith. Elements of what the Bible teaches show very clearly when, when faith is begun. So we, we all, you know, we have our church doctrine, we have our understanding of what the Bible teaches. And sometimes we can be a little critical. We all can be critical. We all want to see great faith on display in some way, shape, or form. But the way to determine when faith is created in the heart of a believer is revealed in Luke 10, 27, and Romans 8, 7. The first fruit of faith is love for God Almighty Himself. If that isn't fundamentally true, if that's not the foundation that, 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 that you have been saved from the wrath to come and your love for God is not there, there I, I say to you that your faith is not well founded. It must be in God because there are so many, I know people that have faith in the Bible. I know people have faith in faith. How about that? There's nothing there. We need to have faith in God and who He is and what He's done. That's the beginning and the end of it. And that's where it begins. Faith produces repentance. Faith creates genuine humility. Faith allows us to comprehend the glory of God and purpose. Faith creates a prayer life. Faith creates selfless love that will love others despite the object of the love. So those that spit in your face, you can love them. You can't do that. The Holy Spirit of God in you creating faith can. Faith calls us out of the world and into the kingdom. Faith gives us spiritual growth. And faith helps us with obedient living. It's, it's, it's not just you got faith and you can do what you want. It doesn't work like that. There are doors that are shut in our life. And we rejoice because God says it's better for us. Don't do that. You know what? Because when you do, it's going to hurt you. God's commands are capricious. God's commands are, are there to ruin your good time. Not at all. He says, don't do those things. They're going to hurt you, my children. Please stay away. Turn from them. <clears throat> and turn to what I said is good. And you will find rest for your souls in that way. So brothers, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it there. We can just... There are so many examples of amazing faith in the Bible. You can think of Daniel. You can think, I mean, just, you walk through Hebrews 11, you know, by faith, Abraham. By faith, Enoch. By faith, see, everyone. I don't have time to tell you about all these great men, and even women of faith in the Bible um, that, you know, conquered kingdoms and did all sorts of amazing things. Just want to think of Joseph for just a moment. Here's one who's sold into slavery by his brothers. He's, he, 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 he's under in jail because of Potiphar's wife. Does his faith waver in jail? I wonder if mine would. I find sometimes my faith is weak. That's why I need you guys to to encourage me, this is what this is about, and it's not like I got any of this figured out any more than any of you, just because I'm standing here in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't work like that at all. I've got my sin, I've got my problems, and you have yours. We all, this is, the, this is the issue, and this is the place just to hear the word, hear the truth that helps and guides and encourages us. Well, 
you think of what the Word of God says, particularly about Joseph. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. And there's no way you could ever say of slavery and jail to say something like that without faith. Incredible, powerful faith. Lord God Almighty, we stand in awe. Lord, that you create faith in your people. Lord, it is you that allows us to believe and then act upon it like it's true because it is. Oh, Lord, would you do that for us? Lord, would you create a powerful faith, Lord, that in this little church, Lord, that we would just be a, 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 a glowing, burning for you, Lord, that we would be bright. We would be reflecting the light of your glory to a dying world. Lord, would you do that in us? Lord, I pray for every soul here that has heard your word, Lord, that they have grown in faith. Lord, I believe that you will do a mighty work in this way. Bless us all for your glory. In Jesus' name.